of Cyprus, one of the most ancient towns of the island. The quiet harbor offers enjoyment to many visitors. learned centuries ago continue behind the windows of its sunlit streets. dominated by its castle, begun during the long period of Byzantine rule on the island. Crusaders and Venetians, in their turn, extended and fortified the castle so that it became an invincible stronghold. Within its massive walls and on its battlements, whole chronicles of history were written. The castle has watched the town grow and flourish, and Kyrenia looked at this durable monument with affection, a part of its life, a permanent link with the past.
Scarcely half a mile away, beneath the sea, was a monument far older than the castle. For centuries, it rested, silent, unsuspected, until a chance discovery by the Kyrenia diver, Andreas Cariolu. It was November 1965. I set out for work, diving for sponges. It looked as if there might soon be turbulence from the north, so I had to work close to the shore at a depth of 100 feet. Returning to the place where the anchor should have been, I noticed it had drifted, and it was as I was following its path that I came across this mass of amphoras. And of course, the joy, what I felt at that moment, is something impossible to describe. I used up all the air and then came up to the surface to see that my boat had drifted a long way off and I just managed to save it from grounding since the sea by now was very rough. Obviously, in the middle of a storm, it had been impossible for me to take any bearings to find the wreck again. To my friends who heard the story, it all sounded like the big fish that got away. Some people took Cariolo's story seriously. Professor Michael Katsev from the United States. We came to Cyprus in 1967 at the invitation of the director of the Department of Antiquities, Dr. Vassilis Karyorgis. It was our intent and our hope to try and locate shipwrecks around the coast of Cyprus. Before then, I, along with a group from the University of Pennsylvania under the direction of Dr. George Bass, had excavated three different ships, one of the late Bronze Age, about the 12th century before Christ, time of the Homeric Wars, another of the Roman period, 4th century AD, and also a Byzantine ship of the 7th century AD. In coming to Cyprus, we hoped to find wrecks of a period that would fill in the gap between the late Bronze Age and the Roman period, a wreck of the classical Greek Age or of the Hellenistic period. We searched the coast and we found several wrecks, but our most important find was when we met Mr. Andreas Cariolo of Crania. Through his graciousness, he agreed to take us out to the site, and when we first dived on it, we immediately realized its importance because of its date. In October of 1967, we then carried out a survey over the site determined approximately its size, some aspects of its cargo, and particularly we're able to determine that one aspect of its cargo, the ancient wine jars, the amphoras, indicated that the ship sank in the latter part of the fourth century before Christ, about the time of Alexander the Great, or just after his death. With this information, because of the uniqueness of the find, we were able to return to the United States and seek funds. Our sponsors appreciated the importance of the find, and so we were able to raise enough money to come back to Cyprus and begin the excavation. However, we first had to find a crew. And here again, we were most fortunate because word very quickly passed through diving circles and we had a number of volunteers who offered their services to the expedition. In all, we had some 12 different countries represented by the crew members on the team and a great variety of different skills, doctors, mechanics, photographers, engineers, and others who could provide the expertise we needed in order to carry out the excavation. And so, in the latter part of the spring of 1968, we returned to Karenia, bringing with us our crew of almost 40 people, large amount of equipment, and in June, we're then able to begin the excavation. On a barge anchored over the wreck is all the equipment needed to sustain a long summer of diving. 
The many volunteers are not professional divers, so every care needs to be taken for their safety. Health checks become routine. This summer, the doctor also served without pay, but there are other forms of compensation. Each diver will make two trips to the site every day. The equipment must be in top condition. As many as six divers may go down in one group, but on the bottom they will pair off, two divers always staying together for safety at the depth of 30 meters. Timing is critical. The entire team waits to leave the surface together. After 40 minutes, the chief diver will sound an alarm through the water to alert the divers that their time is up. A safety shelter, invented by the Katsivs, is put down beside the wreck. Its plastic dome holds fresh flowing air and also a telephone to the barge. In an emergency, a diver can quickly swim into the dome and talk to the surface. Soon, fascinated by the telephone service, the divers begin sending lengthy news bulletins from the wreck. Surveyors learn that metals and many more amphoras lie hidden from sight. Eelgrass has formed a carpet over them. Its thick roots are interwoven like threads of an oriental rug. How can the divers penetrate this barrier? A spear of streaming air brings the answer. Its bubbles loosen the roots, allowing the divers to knife the grass away. Now excavation can begin. An underwater vacuum cleaner called an airlift is set up to suck away the clumps of roots and mud. This will be the excavator's main tool, replacing the shovels and wheelbarrows of land archaeology. A hundred foot plastic pipe carries the discharge away from where the divers work. Most days, their visibility is 20 meters through the clear water. The excavators feed the debris in carefully so that not even the smallest fragment is lost. turned bowl appears. Knowing the location of every such object is most important. So the archaeologists assemble a grid of plastic pipes to divide the site into three meter squares. From the corners of these squares they will measure where each new find appears. Fresh amphoras emerge and each receives a numbered label.
Every so often, a friend points out something the divers missed. Underwater, time is precious. It cannot be wasted making every measurement by hand. To map the amphoras, stereo photography is used. Twice daily, the photographer glides above the site. Over each grid square, he snaps two pictures simultaneously. This records the cargo in three dimensions. Strange stevedores now handle jars last carried 22 centuries ago by ancient Greeks. The pointed bottoms once wedged easily into the ship's hold. Amphoras were made to rest in damp holes within the earth floors of ancient shops and houses. This kept their contents cool and fresh. When pouring, the ancients grabbed the pointed knob to tilt the jar. The extra handle was useful because each amphora filled with wine weighed almost 40 kilos. Black resin lines the inside of the jars. This may explain how the Greeks acquired their taste for resin-flavored wine. Since antiquity, octopus friends grabbing odds and ends made nests in these amphoras. From the jars come ancient almonds, amazingly preserved. Nearly 10,000 were carried originally in sacks on board the ship. The Kyrenia shipwreck is hailed as the most exciting discovery in marine archaeology. Archbishop Makarios, the president of Cyprus, pays a visit to congratulate the team and view the operation, which is carried out in close cooperation with the Cyprus Department of Antiquities. In the excavation, we found over 400 amphorates. The most common type was this example you see here. Today, in France especially, when you order a bottle of wine, you can determine whether it comes from the region of Bordeaux or Burgundy. In antiquity also, each different wine growing area had a very distinct shape. And so we know that these jars came from the island of Rhodes and carried Rhodian wine. On the other hand, this type of jar, of which we found all oh, about 20 to 25, come from the island of Samos and perhaps carried wine or olive oil. We know also uh, that the buyer, when purchasing the commodity, must have had a good indication as to how much he was purchasing. For on the handles, while the clay terracotta is still in the leather hard condition in the potter's workshop, a magistrate seems to have come and stamped, in this instance, the first three letters of his name, Alpha Roiota, in order to certify that it is meeting a standard capacity. The expedition members begin to wonder whether they will have the luck to find any trace of the old ship, the ship from the time of Alexander the Great. Under the amphoras, another cargo appears. Strange blocks of volcanic stone lie in three neat rows. Their function is a mystery. Some of the slabs 
have Greek letters chiseled in their sides. Surrounded by stone puzzles, architect Lena Wild Sweeney discovers that they are all of different sizes. Some are cut with channels and slots. What purpose could they possibly be serving on that last voyage? the Greeks milled grain. An iron ring once held the wooden handle in place. The puzzle of different sizes and shapes can now be solved. 29 stones, an uneven number, were left over after the captain had sold off many more at earlier ports of call. Those millstones not sold were brought back on board and stacked deep within the hull to serve as ballast. Diving has dangers. One is the buildup of nitrogen that can form bubbles in the blood if a diver surfaces too fast. This causes the dreaded bends. After 40 minutes on the site, the divers must take time to breathe out the excess nitrogen. At stations below the barge, they decompress for 36 minutes. A switch to different air hoses begins the ritual. Ingenious ways are found to pass the time. Here is Assistant Director Robin Piercy on the hazards of diving. Diving at depth, and as we were, to over 100 feet, presents many problems, the most serious of which is what would happen if a diver got bent or suffered from Kaysen's disease. This is the most serious form of accident that can happen and is usually announced by the fact that the diver suffers uh, nausea, pain in the joints, and even vomiting. If he's not treated by recompression very quickly in a recompression chamber, then he can suffer permanent paralysis or even death in the most serious cases. Towards the end of 1969, we had, luckily for us, a very mild case. Alfred had been down to 100 feet for 40 minutes and had decompressed according to the tables. He came up and felt nauseous and a little dizzy, but, but luckily very little pain. After a very brief examination by the doctor, who we always have on board, it was decided to put him immediately into our compression chamber. When the diver reaches land air pressure again in the chamber after this long period of time, he is brought out of the chamber, and with any luck, um, he is perfectly normal again. He feels perhaps a little tired, but after about 24 hours good rest, and perhaps three days uh, convalescence, he is allowed back in the water to continue his diving. Luckily enough for us, Alfred was such a case. He treated in a very short time, and he was diving again within two days. There is also excitement in this kind of work. Susan Wumer Katsev. In each of us, there is an expectancy, wondering that day what may turn up on the bottom. And it is a terrific thrill to be the first person to handle or just see a a glimpse of a piece of pottery, perhaps something like a plate such as this, that has been covered on the sea bottom and last touched more than 2,000 years ago by ancient mariners. You see, a wreck is 
like a tomb. Everything that was carried on board a ship went down in one package. It's literally a time capsule. And you know that most everything, if it's cargo and the kitchen crockery, some personal possessions of the sailors, is there for the finding. And it's just your luck if you happen to be the one that day that makes the first find. As if tumbled from a cabin shelf, kitchen pottery lies clustered together. A little jug once held olive oil. Perhaps in this clay mortar, the crew mashed garlic, beans, or even almonds. Conservation begins as soon as objects reach the surface. These pieces will always remain in Cyprus, where they were found. But the archaeologists need to take home as much information about them as possible. What catalogues and photographs cannot always tell is revealed by measured drawings, half in contour, half in cutaway. A careful study of the kitchen pottery reveals how the sailors lived. But one thing still eludes us. We don't know whether or, in fact, if they ever did cook on board because we've not found anything of the hearth. We have found the cauldron, some casserole uh, bowls, and some other uh, cooking utensils, but whether they cooked on board, we're not certain. We imagine, actually, that they might have called into a little cove or taken an outrage at the end of each day, gone ashore to cook their meals. What did they cook? Well, we know they fished on board from the lead net fishing weights. We also imagine that they must have eaten grain and cereals and perhaps even some of the almonds. It was part of the cargo on board the ship. The various pottery certainly gives us an excellent indication of what they fed themselves upon. We have found four little oil jugs, four pitchers to pour into four drinking cups. In fact, we found a, a repetition of four different examples of almost every different shape, including uh, plates. And finally, the conclusion that we were dealing with a crew of a captain and three mates uh, seemed to be inescapable when we found, and this is one example, of fragments of four wooden spoons. Who was the captain? We don't know. Perhaps we have one clue in that on this uh, unique example of a fishing plate, within the foot we have the uh, someone, uh, perhaps Captain as I said, inscribing three letters of his name, Epsilon, Upsilon, P. And this may suggest to us the name of our captain. What course did the captain and his three sailors follow? We think that they left Samos bound for Kos. Here, the crew filled the open hold with heavy millstones, setting sail for Rhodes. At a Rhodian harbor, trading is brisk. 300 amphoras of thick red wine come on board. The captain must have hoped for buyers farther south and sailed to Cyprus, which was then famous for her almonds. But when did the ship and her crew come to grief within sight of the ancient harbor at Kyrenia? A few bronze coins found scattered in the wreckage tell us that the year was about 300 BC. After two summers of delicate digging, the treasure emerges. Sealed under a layer of mud and sand is the ship itself, rib after rib in proud alignment. No man had yet been privileged to see an ancient ship so perfectly preserved in the sea. This was the earliest seagoing ship ever discovered. 
Sharp edges of metal appear around the bow. The ship wore an armor of lead plates to keep her watertight. Measurements for every timber must be made and labels carefully applied because the excavators soon realize that the wood is too soft to attempt lifting the hull in one piece. For its own safety, the ship will have to be taken apart and raised in separate pieces. The divers invent a new machine to map the ship. They call it the cheese cutter after its adjustable prongs which span the hull and slide on wires to measure every curve to the millimeter. Gently, lovingly, the first precious pieces are raised to the surface. An ancient steering oar waits with archaeologists through decompression. Plank by plank, the old ship is dismantled. The coded pieces are brought to metal lifting trays. A simple bed sheet will protect their passage through the water. After centuries in water, the wood's microscopic cells have lost all strength. What looks like wood is now 75% water. The timber has the feel of soggy bread. In the courtyard of Kyrenia Castle, five tons of fragile wood go into a preliminary bath of fresh water. The timber must be kept wet until some way can be found to preserve it. Crusader Gallery becomes the ship's new home. Coddled like premature babies in an incubator, the pieces are washed over and over again to remove salt and sand. The soft planks are riddled with shells and holes left by marine worms called teridos. The excavators are determined to rebuild the ship from the worm riddled pieces. A great deal of information has to be catalogued before the risky process of preservation can begin. The team photographs every scrap of wood and makes several thousand full scale drawings to record each piece in detail. The 
hours stretch into two years of patient recording. From this mass of details, the expedition's reconstructor will draw up blueprints for rebuilding the hull. He needs to calculate what shape the ship had before she sank, for the waterlogged wood has flattened over the centuries from the weight of so much cargo. Soon, drawings of the keel begin to reveal its original curve. But still, a way has to be found to preserve the wood and give it strength. Conservator Francis Talbot Vasiliadou. This is a piece of waterlogged wood. Um, it's one of maybe 6,000 pieces that came from the Kyrenia ship. It may look like a fairly sound piece of wood, but after 2,300 years under the sea, in fact, the cellulose, the structure of the wood, has mostly disintegrated and been lost. If we allowed this piece of wood to dry out in the atmosphere, slowly even, I'm afraid we'd probably ha end up with something that's much like this. As you can see, it, it is quarter of the original thickness and rather twisted and warped. In fact, how could we reconstruct a ship with wood like this? My problem then was to convert this waterlogged piece of wood into another piece of wood that would be suitable for reconstruction without losing any of the dimensions of it. Synthetic wax was the answer to the problem. The chemical is called polyethylene glycol. It gives body to such modern day products as lipstick, ice cream and chocolate. Tests show that small pieces are absorbing the chemical well. Almonds become saturated after three months. But to penetrate the ship's wood, the conservator estimates that most pieces will need to remain in the hot solution for an entire year. Final scrubbing launches preservation. On rigid trays, the wood goes into metal tanks. They are built to heat the wax and keep it circulating. The conservator notes the position of each piece in the stacking pattern. This great block once supported the ship's mast. Because of its size, it demands two years in the solution. Throughout preservation, the conservator checks dimensions. For should some pieces warp or change in size during treatment, it would be impossible to reconstruct the ship. After 10 months, one tank is ready. The wood is saturated 100% with the waxy solution. It is slippery and very, very hot. Wearing layers of rubber gloves and heavy clothing for protection, the team works at the unloading. Steaming sponges wipe off extra wax. The treatment is a success.
The wood may crack if it cools too fast. In plastic bags, it will be stored on heated shelves, then cooled gradually to room temperature. Models of ships have come down to us from antiquity. This playful helmsman from the Cyprus Museum steers his boat by two great oars. So it was with our wine trader. The Kyrenia ship reveals that the Greeks built boats by eye alone. The ship reconstructor Richard Steffi. Practically nothing is known of ancient ship construction and so we have been required to build this research model to determine some of the ancient shipwrights techniques. It's uh, one-fifth full size and built of all the original materials. Uh, Aleppo pine for the planking, copper for the nails and oak for the tenons which fasten the strakes together. It's been a, quite a fruitful model. We are learning uh, much about the ancient shipwrights technology. For instance, we've discovered that he used no geometry at all in, in constructing the ship, but uh, more or less eyeballed the planks into shape. We've learned uh, what tools he's, he's used and uh, also uh, what uh, he did for uh, the various parts of the ship and the way of uh, fastening materials and so forth. We've even been able to discover a few mistakes that he's made in the stern and later corrected. Without uh, this research model, it would be impossible to reconstruct the original ship. As with shipbuilding today, the ancients started with the keel. But here, the resemblance ends. From the keel, the entire shell of outside planks was built first. These pine boards, called strakes, were joined edge to edge by oak slats or tenons that fit down into cuttings known as mortises. The crew is much relieved to be duplicating only a portion of the ship at full scale because there were 4,000 tenons and 8,000 mortises in the original. The shell is like an open basket of interwoven joinery. wooden pegs bind the tenons in place. Only now did the Greeks begin to shape the ribs, known as frames. Much can be learned from duplicating the ancient tools, but modern equipment saves time. Today, modern ships grow from a skeleton of frames bolted to the keel. From this skeleton, anyone hangs. But to the ancients, the frames were nothing more than braces outward against the sea. The shell, joined by thousands of tenons, was the ship's true strength. Fifth look. 
looks pretty good. I have to okay. secure with the copper spikes. It's going to be quite a job getting into that wood. Uh, first, though, we must put the tree nails in. Right. Drill the hole, put the trenel in. Okay. A spike of pure copper splits a wooden trenel as it is driven from the outside through strake and frame. Inside, the spike is slowly clenched down over the frame top. Many such copper staples clamped the frames into the shell. Bronze saws and adzes of the Greeks must have needed almost constant sharpening because the Aleppo pine is tough and filled with sap. Handling waxfield pine is far different. This strake was broken in antiquity. It is now too fragile to support even its own weight. After having warmed the fragments with heat lamps, the conservator forces pins of stainless steel deep inside to join the fragments together. It takes four people a year to clean the 6,000 pieces of wood for reconstruction. This brings out grain and ancient tool marks. Carbon-14 dating labs at the University of Pennsylvania had calculated that the trees used to build the Kyrenia ship were cut about the year 389 BC, but the almonds on board were harvested a hundred years later. Could the ship have been in use over such a long period? The cleaning leads to a startling discovery. Many of the frames and strakes came originally from another ship. This solves the problem of the carbon-14 dates. The men who built the Kyrenia ship took some of their wood from an earlier boat and reused it. That wood could easily have served in the two boats over a period of a hundred years. But the ship which sank off Kyrenia had been hauled out and repaired many times. This gives evidence that she saw a long life, perhaps serving several generations of mariners. This ship is... Uh and all ancient ships were built uh, somewhat differently than modern ships in that the planking was put on before the frames. Today we put the framework on the keel first and then uh, commence to plank the ship. On an old reconstruction such as this, we've developed a lot of problems. The wood is quite uh, brittle when you drop a piece, or if you would drop a piece, we hope not to, uh, it would break like glass. Also, we, ha we find it's uh, quite uh, susceptible to moisture because the chemical that was for treatment soaks up moisture almost like a blotter. And so we had to develop a new system of fastening. The ancients used uh, copper spikes to drive through the planking and into the frames, whereas we must use uh, stainless steel wire 
and we found that uh, by using literally thousands of wires, we have a much stronger ship than using the old bolting or annealing method. Uh, presently, we have a wire just about every two inches all along the straight joints, that is the edge of the planks. And uh, we have three or four wires through each frame on each plank as well. You might say the ship is literally wired together. This is a ship's mast step. This ship carried a single mast, and it was a bit different than modern ships in that the mast could be laid down. They did this because uh, uh, it reduced the center of gravity, and it made the ship more easy to handle in port. So the mast was laid aft to the stern, and the heel of it fit into this block. The block which possibly weighs well over 100 pounds was uh, made of a hard form of alder wood. Off Kyrenia, a miniature in fiberglass begins its first sea trials. With cargo, the ship made four, maybe five knots speed. A big square sail reefed up through guide rings. Hundreds of such rings of lead were found in the excavation. Many of the finds are put on show in a special gallery provided by the Cyprus Department of Antiquities in Kyrenia Castle. The exhibition draws thousands of visitors. While work of rebuilding the ship goes on, in 1975, the Cyprus government and UNESCO experts install a climate control system for the ship to keep the wax and wood at constant temperature and humidity. A team of dedicated people, combining love and determination, worked for eight years so that others could share in their new knowledge from the sea. Archaeology surpasses all frontiers, but war is not so generous. A military line divided Cyprus following the Turkish invasion. Tragically, the Kyrenia ship and all her finds became inaccessible to most tourists and to the Greeks of Cyprus, whose heritage they recall. One important question remains to be answered. Why did the ship go down? Just underneath the hull were iron spearheads. Some were bent from impact with the ship. Valuable objects are missing from the wreck. So are all the sailors' belongings. And what happened to the captain's purse of coins from that last summer's trading? The conclusion seems inescapable. Sometime about the year 300 BC, the captain and his crew were attacked by pirates of Kyrenia. The fate of those sailors we will never know, but their scuttled ship, so marvelously preserved by the sea, at last yields up this awesome secret. In antiquity, the nation that controlled the seas could control her destiny. In the classical and Hellenistic periods, it was Greece who held that power. We have little knowledge of her warships and her merchant marine, but with the discovery of the Kyrenia ship, its excavation and reconstruction, we have now, through this one example, been able to contribute an immense amount of knowledge. She was originally about 45 feet in length, carrying a cargo of over 20 tons. We have, through our good fortune, been able to reassemble approximately 75% of that merchant ship, and through the reconstruction, have learned so much. In years ahead, we hope that our archaeologists will be able to go to the bottom of the sea and find more examples of Greek ships. But for now, we have reassembled this, the first ancient ship of the Greek period found, and we hope 
that by reassembling her, students and scholars will be able to come and study the remains and learn even more about the ships and the seafaring that were so important in antiquity. <laughs> Το καράβι, τ' αρχαίο το καράβι απ' τα βάθη των καιρών. Ξανάρθε στου ανθρώπου, ξανάρθε στου ανθρώπου με νέα μοίρα πια. Να μην του τύχουν, να μην του τύχουν πειρατέ, να μην ξαναβουλιάσουν. 